Thank you, Sheldon. Let us pray. Lord, you are good. You are holy. Lord, we give you praise for being our creator, being our sustainer. Lord, we give you thanks for this day, this holy day, this Sabbath day that you have made for us to come as a, as a body, as a, as a family, to worship you. Lord, we ultimately thank you for Christ, that you sent your only begotten Son to shed his blood, to die on the cross for our sins, to defeat death and resurrect again from the dead, to now declare us righteous. Lord, as we look at your word this morning in John 12, be with us as sinners, that we would understand your word, that it would transform our hearts and our minds, that you would be with me, a sinner, as I seek to proclaim it with grace and truth and humility. In all these things, we pray. Amen. So we are just coming out of John 11, a wonderful chapter, the story of Lazarus, of him being resurrected, of him being raised back to life after being dead four days. Um, an incredible miracle that those who uh, saw it either came to believe in him or they wanted to kill him. And as we'll see uh, later on in verses 9 and through 11, not just Christ also, but even the beneficiary, even the recipient of such miracle, Lazarus. But we'll get to that uh, later next week, start next week. But here, as we start in John 12, um, we are really starting here up to the moment of his crucifixion. This is, this is six days. Six days. We have a week here before Christ dies, before Christ is murdered. And so Jesus has returned to Bethany. He had fled out and uh, was in Ephraim for a little bit, has returned back uh, to Bethany, has come to celebrate, uh, to have a feast. Uh, seemingly before uh, the raising of Lazarus from the dead, this was not going to be a feast of celebration and joy in homecoming, uh, but one of sorrow and grief and despair. But indeed, it is a time of celebration and joy for, for Mary and Martha and Lazarus, of course. Uh, you know, I, I can't imagine uh, him not being happy. Uh, and also his disciples in, in Christ. So, uh, Jesus has brought Lazarus back to life. And, and he has successfully fled uh, the Jewish leaders, those who want uh, to take his life. And um, is now residing in Bethany for this feast. And this feast is obviously certain, certainly warranted uh, for Christ. And so, um, like I said earlier, we're, we're, kind of, we're, we're in the last week of, of, um, of Christ's life on earth. And if you've been kind of following along in our, in our Bible reading plan, because this, this is the time of the Passover feast, the, the, the preparation for that. And if you've been following around, along in our reading plan, today is actually, we're finishing up Exodus. And Exodus 12 is where we read about the Passover, uh, where, where the Israelites sacrificed a young lamb, smeared the blood on the outside of their doorposts um, to protect them uh, from, from death, from the killing of, the, of their firstborn. And what is taking place now for, in Jesus' day is this, this week-long celebra celebration, this week-long kind of cleansing, really, in preparation for the Passover feast. Uh, they, and now they are starting this week in the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And, have, and, that, and here we get an incredible story about Martha's love and admiration and thankfulness toward her Savior. Let's read verses uh, 1 through 3 again. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. 
Martha therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Mary wants to show her, her appreciation, her devotion to Jesus for, late, for raising Lazarus back from the dead. And she chose to wipe his feet with perfume, with a luxury perfume, a, a pound of ointment that was made of, of pure nard. This, this word pure or genuine uh, is, is focusing on both the exact quality or the consistency of this. It's, it's a very fine and um, smooth type of um, nard, type of perfume, type of ointment. But also uh, showing the expensive, or how expensive it is. Uh, this is one of, if not the most uh, expensive ointments in Jesus' day. And seemingly, we not, we're not sure exactly how um, Mary came to uh, have such uh, a luxury ointment. Perhaps she inherited it. Perhaps she's coming from a wealthy family. We're not, we're not exactly uh, sure on that. But either way, uh, this type of nard was used on very special, very rare occasions. Uh, the, this, this, uh, it, was, it was wrote, as one, com one commentator said, was an act of of extreme extravagance. So such an act was, was most commonly done uh, to kings in the Old Testament. We see this referred uh, in 1 Samuel 8, where God, through Samuel, directs, directly connects the anointing of perfume uh, to the required service of being a king. And we can accurately say then that, that Mary here, in anointing Jesus with perfume, was treating Jesus as royalty. As a king, she finished by, by wiping Jesus' feet with her hair. Usually, this would be done with a towel, you know, something um, more uh, cleaner than, cleaner than, than hair. Uh, the, the hair, I think, points for us, uh, it's a very scandalous um, nature of this, the, of this anointing. The dropping, of, the dropping of one's hair, I think, in, in the, in the uh, ancient world was really a, a sign uh, of posture, a posture sign of, of just great humility and gratitude. And, and in doing so, Martha, seeing that Jesus was not, was, not, was not just as a man or even a king-like figure, but rather the king, not a king of the Old Testament, as referred to in 1 Samuel 8 or in other places, but the king, the only king worthy of such posture and act and reverence. We also see in verse 3 the, the amount of perfume that's used. It's, it took a pound of expensive ointment. Um, the, pound, uh, the amount that she uses is it's so pungent a pound today would, would probably resonate to about 11 ounces to put that into to our context. And, you know, that only takes a couple sprays for me, at least a couple sprays is I don't, not even an ounce, I think maybe a quarter of an ounce, I'm not even sure. But um, 11 ounces of perfume of this rich, luxurious ointment, you got to imagine that is perforating throughout. I mean, it, it says it at the end of verse 3, the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. They were overwhelmed with it. What comes to mind for me is when uh, I was in seventh grade, junior high, middle school boy, going through all the things of puberty. My voice is squeaking every two seconds. I smell like rotten eggs, no matter how many times I shower, no matter how many swipes of deodorant. And what was just great that my school did was that uh, for basketball season that year, we had to practice in the morning. There weren't enough gyms after school. The, the eighth graders got the, the big gym and the small gym, and so we were stuck going in the morning, 6 a.m., going there for practice. And um, I'm sure our parents really appreciated waking up then at 5.30 to get us out of bed, but... Um, we would go to practice, and then I also had the luxury that year of having PE first hour. I was nasty. Like, I rotted, I stank, I was, it was disgusting. I was worse than, a, than, than, than 
pigs in a hog barn. It was terrible. And so, um, what was the solution? Axe body spray. <laughs> I showered myself, no pun intended, I showered myself in axe from head to toe. I probably went through a can a week. I, that's not really an exaggeration. I, I, people, I was ha passing it around. People were spraying Lysol on things. It was bad. It was bad. Um, but if you've ever, you know, axe is pretty extreme. One swipe and you're good. Covering yourself head to toe, uh, it's going to make you cough. I don't know if you've ever been what's called axe bombed. Someone just turns it on and it just goes forever and you're like, coughing. You feel like you know, you're dying of asphyxi asphyxi asphyxiation. Uh, but uh, it's bad. And that, it, just, it just perforated the entire locker room and uh, the classrooms. And I'm sure teachers stood away uh, because all, I could, all they could smell on me was axe um, body spray. And this is how I, I picture, really, the, the ointment perforating every crevice of the house. No corner is safe. You can't find a room in the house where it doesn't smell of this, of this ointment, of this pound of luxurious perfume. Why, why so much, then? Why so much ointment? Why a pound of of luxurious I mean, this is this is expensive stuff. This is as as we see, Judas points out that this is worth three hundred denarii. Three hundred denarii was roughly a year's wages. She spent a year's wages to put perfume on Jesus' feet. Why so much perfume? Why didn't she just you know a spray or a sprinkle, a sprinkle maybe a small dab, a small amount on the feet? I think it's because she felt in, endowed to him. She owed him everything she had. Not just a portion, not just a tiny bit, not just what she was comfortable with, everything. Her entire year's wages, perhaps even what she had inherited from a family member. She felt endowed to Jesus. There was something inside Mary that said, no amount of perfume, of ointment is enough for the gift that Jesus gave me in returning Lazarus from the dead. I'm sure that if she had 5, 10, 20 pounds, 50 pounds of this ointment, she would still be saying and thinking the same thing. A year's worth of wages Seemingly, to Judas, poured down the drain for a worthless cause. But what a beautiful picture for us this is, isn't it? Mary thought it was worthy and necessary to cover Jesus' feet, which I can imagine not the cleanest. Feet are already gross in and of themselves. With her precious ointment that she saved up as, as long as, for as, up to as long as she could have it. A worldly person reads this story and sees Mary as outrageous. It's too much. Save it. Save it for yourself. Save it for others. They see it through the lens of Judas. But Jesus, Mary and us today know that no amount of precious ointment or anything that we have to offer would suffice for the praise and glory that Jesus deserves. No amount of songs or hymns we sing, no amount of Bible reading we do, no amount of prayer, no amount of serving, of, of, of fasting, of whatever it may be, of tithing, no amount will ever suffice, will ever satisfy the amount of glory and honor that our holy God deserves. What does he deserve? You ask, wow, what is he owed? What is Christ owed? Everything. Everything. 
all that we are and all that we have. It's, it's, it's no wonder why the first question of the Westminster Catechism says, what, what is the chief end of man? And the answer, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's our purpose. That's our goal. Glorify God and enjoy him forever. It's no, it's no wonder why Solomon, in writing the book of Ecclesiastes, through searching every crevice in the world, every possible way for wisdom, for knowledge, for success, he, see, he has searched every avenue imaginable, but he quickly sees that all of those is vanity. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. All is vanity. It's all but a fleeting breath. What then is the ultimate conclusion? Well, he says it in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. It's no wonder why Jesus in Matthew 22, 37, in the giving of the greatest, in the greatest, in the giving of the greatest commandment, that we are to first love the Lord with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. He says this is the great and first commandment. The great and first commandment and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. You know, I think, I think many people get us wrong. They get the Christian faith wrong. By some... The Christian mantra portrayed in the world, to the world is this, to love others, which is true. We are called to love others. We are called to care for others, to care for the needy, to care for the poor. But why? If, if we do not love God first, we cannot love others. We love, as John says in 1 John 4, we love because he first loved us. Mary had her focus on Christ. On loving Christ. On admiring Christ for what he has done. Little did she know that she would be seeing Jesus in just a little bit of a week later, dying on the cross for her and for you and for me. Little did she know the symbolism of her anointing, of anointing Jesus before the Passover to be the ultimate sacrifice for us. Martha simply sought to humbly come before him and devote her life's earnings, her life's wages, her year's wages, of, to glorifying him for what he had done. So, so, so now, we move that, we, now we move on to verses 4 through 6 where we see Judas offer his point of contention. Let's read verses 4 through 6. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having, char having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus Skipped ahead. Pause. Judas's concern seems not to be on giving Jesus' rightful honor, but to caring for the poor and sending to those in need. The Christian life demands this of us. It's looking to the great to the second command the second of the greatest commandments, love our neighbors as ourselves. Taking it at face value, Judas seems to have good intentions. Jesus doesn't need this. He's not in need of this. The poor need it. He's on face value, thinking he has a good heart behind this. But John makes it clear to us that Judas' intentions were not pure, but rather deceitful. What was thought to be an altruistic, what was thought to be altruistic by Judas is, is clearly seen by Jesus and, and now his disciples, right? High in sight is 2020, as envious and maleficent. Note here that, that Judas would betray Jesus about for a third of the amount that Mary, where her ointment was worth. A third of that he betrayed. 
the Savior of the world, the man whom he followed day in and day out. Also note that it seems the gospel writers cannot stop reminding us just who Judas is. Let's just make sure we know who Judas Iscariot is. Verse 4, he who was about to betray him. The one who betrayed Jesus. The one who did not care about the poor, as verse 6 says, but was a thief. And was stealing money from the money bag for the disciples. Using it for his own selfish gain. This isn't the only place that we see this. We see this all throughout the Gospels. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They want us to remember just who Judas is. And I get that. Imagine, imagine walking with Jesus, a group of men, following, following him seemingly correctly and well in step, in faith, in Christ. And then one of your own turns his back on him. Not an outsider, not, not a Jewish leader, but one of, you, one of your own. Turns your back on Christ. I think we can all sympathize with that, can't we? I've known people in my life who grew up in the church, who were baptized, who went through catechism, who read their Bible, who were good people, and ultimately they leave. And there's a pain. There's a sorrow. They, le- they, they leave the body. They, they're no longer believers. They deny Christ. They seek their own way. And it's painful. And I can imagine that's what the disciples are feeling here too, which is probably why they keep on repeating it. Just so you know, this guy's a thief. Trust me, we know, we saw So, John wants us to see here the motive that Judas is proposing. It's not out of a care for the poor, but it's because he was too worried about material gain and wealth. He stole what was given to all the disciples for his own benefit. He did not follow Jesus, but instead he followed his own desires, the desires of his own heart, of his own flesh. This story concludes, though, with, this, with Jesus confronting Judas and putting him in his place. Jesus knows the intentions of Judas. He knows the intentions have, he, he's, why he's giving these concerns. And he is sure to take Judas and all others present to school. And us too. Let's read verses 7 and 8. Jesus said, Leave her alone. Leave Mary alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. Jesus offers here both the value and the meaning of what Martha has done. Jesus defends Mary and what she has done for him and goes on to foreshadow his death in verse 8. But you do not always have me. Jesus knew this perfume was always intended to be used on him. The anointing of a king was at the beginning of their reign uh, throughout the ancient world. And Jesus offers insight into the particular kingship that he is about to serve, he is about to be serving in. Mary may have served Jesus in a scandalous manner by giving up her yearly wages worth of perfume. But it was Jesus who poured out his entire inheritance given to him by the Father through the shedding of his own blood on the cross. Jesus took our sin debt upon himself, bore it on the cross, and became the propitiation for our sins. He satisfied God's wrath. Not only so, but he has imputed to us, as Isaiah 61.10 says, he has imputed to us the robe of righteousness, the garments of salvation thus declaring us righteous in the eyes of God. Christ's kingship would be one of sacrifice for those whom God has given him, the perfect and noblest king of all. So he addresses the meaning of what Mary has done, and now he explains the value 
of the anointing. Jesus does not deny the poor and needy and, 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 and deny their place in the, Christian, in, in the place for us to serve them in the Christian life. He surely knows that one of the many calls for followers of him is to tend to the needs of the poor because he commanded us to. He taught us to. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus commands us in, verse, in Matthew 6 to give to the needy. Jesus' ministry was focused on those in need. Yes, in material need, but ultimately in spiritual need. Those of us, which is all of us, in need of spiritual rebirth. This is what he values most here. Jesus is revealing to his disciples. He's revealing to all of those in the house. He's revealing to you and I through his word this morning that the object of our primary and sole devotion must be Christ. And it must be Christ alone. It's not that it can be. It must be. It has to be. He does not mince his words. What does he say in John 14, 6? I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is clear, this is clear first commandment language. From Deuteronomy 5, 7, you shall have no other gods before me. Our care for the poor and needy are direct expressions of our love and devotion to our Savior first and foremost. If our hearts are not geared towards, towards obeying, towards glorifying, towards enjoying the things of God, then Mary's actions look foolish to us. But if we are geared toward obeying and glorifying and enjoying the things of God, if we have been reborn by the grace and love of God, we would be right next to Mary. Wiping our yearly earnings and savings on the feet of our Savior. Bowing down before him with all humility, with all devotion. He alone deserves all the glory and praise now and forevermore. Amen. Well, as, as, we, as we turn our hearts and minds toward communion this morning, this is an opportunity, I think, as we, as we take of the bread and of the juice, to, to cast our cares upon the Lord. To, to, to rely on the Lord in, 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 as, as Mary did, trusting that he, that he was enough and that he was worthy of such praise. Judas did not think so. Judas did not think of Christ as worthy. The chief priests did not think Jesus as worthy of praise. They thought him worthy of death death on a cross. But Mary saw Jesus and thought, he is worthy of my honor, of my praise, and of all the glory. How can I be so sure? Well, well Romans 8, one of the great chapters in all of Scripture. Verse 32 says, he who did not, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? When we cast our cares upon the Lord, when we trust in him, when we glorify him and enjoy him in all things, we know that all things necessary for this life, for eternal life, for the Christian life, will be given to us by grace through faith in his Son, by the indwelling, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Through partaking in the Eucharist, we, we remind ourselves and confess with, with our, not just our mouths, but with, with action that we, like Mary, know that we are forever endowed to our creator and our sustainer, to the man who died on the cross, to the one who indwells us. We confess that our, our bodies are broken, that there, is, that there is nothing that we can do to atone for our sins and to reconcile ourselves to God, to make peace with God. Ultimately, we praise God for loving us so much that he didn't even spare his own son, but sent him 
but sent him he, who knew no sin to be sin for us. That we would be adopted into God's family and spend eternity with our Father in heaven. If you can confess that this morning wholeheartedly, this meal is for you. If you are here this morning, perhaps it's your first time, perhaps you're not really sure about this gospel message, message perhaps you're not sure, maybe completely rejecting and denying the fact that Christ is worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. I would ask that, that you would not partake of communion this morning. We are so glad that you're here. This is the place uh, for you to be this morning. We, this, there is no other place where we would want you to be than in God's church hearing his word. But we, we do not want this to put you in a place of hypocrisy. We, we also don't want you, this to confuse you. We don't take this to save us. We don't take this to even make ourselves better Christians, to sanctify ourselves. But rather, we, we do this to confess that we are in need of Christ and to remember just what Christ has done on the cross for our sins. If that is you this morning, I, I would love to afterward talk with you or, or Ryan or Jeremy or one of the elders, really anybody that you see around, would love to talk with you and chat with you and just share with you the good news of the gospel. But if that is you, let us come, ye sinners. Let us take at this table and remember what Christ has done for us and just how worthy he is of our praise. Let us pray. Lord, we confess that we are wretched and vile sinners. That the thoughts and deeds of our hearts are only evil continually. that we desire our own flesh, that we desire our own way. And Lord, that we are in desperate need of salvation. But Lord, you have been gracious and loving toward us in sending your son to die on the cross, to take our place, to be our substitute, to take upon our sin and give us his robe of righteousness, the garments of salvation, that we would be declared righteous and be adopted into your kingdom. Lord, as we partake of communion this morning, help us to remember that fact. Help us to find joy and peace in the blood and sacrifice of your son. Knowing that his death has atoned for all sin for all eternity. And that only him is worthy of our praise and all glory and all the honor. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.